Hi everyone. It is that time. I am here with you again. Get to go live every single week and today we have a very special guest. My dear friend Mark Sklar, also known as the fertility expert, and him and I are going to come to you live and do a fertility Q&A. So you guys come prepared with your questions and I'm going to bring Mark right on. Hi. Hey, Amy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm excited. It's been a long time since I we've know. done one of these. Oh, it's so fun. It's so fun. How's everything <laughs> in, in San Diego? Everything is wonderful. How about you? Good 4th of July? Yeah, we had such a nice time. <laughs> good. Really good. Yeah. Lots of fireworks around here, you know, but it was fun. It was fun. Um, yeah. So let's see. That's Did wonderful. we get questions that you saw on your feed at all no did i i don't think i saw any questions so we're just going to let you guys start rolling in with some questions what do you want to ask mark and i yeah we're here for you yeah fertility related questions let them roll you guys can use the question box i will do my best to remember to check that i'm not always the best at that uh, working on it always a work in progress <laughs> uh, or you guys can just post in the comments and ask us some questions um, but I have a question. I was on a call with Sarah, one of my associates earlier today, and we were talking about nuclear transfers, the like kind of latest and greatest, if you will, of what's going on in the world of IVF, you know, um, where they take basically the yolk, if you will, of the younger woman and then replace the white so right. and, and so she's got a genetic a genetically you know uh embryo that's hers but with like youth kind of surrounding it so i don't know what are, what are your thoughts on this in this i mean i think you know these things are bound to happen with with the world the fertility world that we live in and technology and advancements and people are always trying to push the envelope um and do some sort of new thing and hybrid and and so forth I, I don't know. It's, I think it's really fascinating on one side. I think it's really interesting and cool. It makes me think of some sort of sci-fi movie, you know, yeah, or show is. that we're going to start blending all sorts of genetic material and see what happens. And so it's really fascinating from a science perspective. I think from a human perspective, it's a bit scary for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's just, Apparently, it seems, it's being it seems done outside of the U.S. Um, there's there's one doctor here in the New York area that I guess is sending women abroad to some clinic who's actually doing it. Um, and I know Dr. Murr, he has been talking about like it, it is a potential for the future. So start like stop discarding even immature embryos or immature eggs is what he's saying actually. Right, because then you could use it. You could use that you material use down right. the road. So yeah, yeah, I agree. It's it seems sci-fi, but I think so did genetic testing. If you remember, like PGS testing, it was like, or gender select. You know, you were like, "Huh, this is fascinating." You know, like we can really we can rule out all the genetics. It's fascinating because that happened during our time. You know what I mean? We were we worked pre PGS testing, and then all of a sudden it was like, or even. Um, you know, the, the freezing of the embryos and moving to FETs, that wasn't obviously nearly as scientific, but just sure. this, you know, these trends and these changes. So it's like, it's kind of fascinating to see. Okay, we have bound questions. to happen. It That's is. for sure. Yeah, bound to happen. Um, so here's a question. Is there okay. really nothing that can be done for fibroids when you're going through IVF? I have a significant size fibroid outside my uterus that is so large, it doesn't allow for them to really see follicles and count them on my left ovary you guys um, can they still retrieve from that side or they just can't do anything whatsoever um, yeah it just says it doesn't allow them for, to see and count but i don't know she doesn't mention about retrieval so erica yeah. you're here maybe uh you, you can, can chime comment. in a little bit yeah um, i mean it's you know fibroids are especially that size on one side, you want to take care, you want to try to reduce the size as much as possible. And on the other side is you're concerned or they're concerned about potentially damaging something if they can't see everything, if they go in. 
Um, and it is, you know, if it's on the outside, it's that large. It's a major surgery. It's not something um, that is going to be small. Recovery takes time. So it really just depends. I've seen women with grapefruit or larger fibroids get pregnant, have healthy pregnancies, maintain a healthy pregnancy. So in the grand scheme, I think part of the reason that they say that is because if they don't believe it should hinder your ability to get pregnant, then they might not want to, you know, do anything about it at the time and kind of less is more. Yeah, and I also think there's a lot we can do from a Chinese medicine perspective. Yeah. You know, we we would see the fibroid as as some time type of like blood stagnation or phlegm accumulation and you know dietary approaches, herbal approaches. I do think things like castor oil packs and Avrigo abdominal massage. Uh, things of that nature can also really help reduce the size. I've seen lots of women not necessarily get rid of the fibroids, but shrink them down. And that could make then the situation more manageable for you. Um, how long How long would you say it would take someone? I mean, she's got a considerable size. So how yeah. long would you say it takes her if we did that approach? Six months. Yeah, I say minimum six months. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the other piece is just time yeah. that you've got but to like, be aware of. But you could, like, I'll do this in some cases where she, if she's trying naturally, I, I would, during follicular phase, use more aggressive herbs. Yeah. And so, I, like, I would break up the treatment so that yeah. if she then didn't get pregnant, then I would go after it again, right? And so, because sure. sometimes it's the same thing with fertility, right? It's on this spectrum of, like, how much it needs to shift, you know, and we never know until right. we're in there doing it. But um, yeah. I do think there's a lot of things you could do on the more natural, holistic side to help manage yeah. that without surgery. Because I agree, it's that's a major abdominal surgery. That's like a C-section, and the recovery is intense. And you know, the uterus uh, takes a while to heal and be able to hold a, a pregnancy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so egg quality diet for freezing eggs. Attempting my first this November. S any must do to prep um to prep for egg freezing um for egg quality so she's I, doing it right what was that yeah do she's the egg quality it. diet follow, follow <laughs> the egg quality diet I wrote, I wrote a book called the egg quality diet i would follow that um i do think actually like i, I had an interview yesterday and I, I pitched to the journalist actually i was like if you ever want to do a story talking more about preparing for egg freezing which i, I had done a story a while ago but and I, and I know you talk about it too, but I think it's like a really important conversation to start having as like, especially like all, all the world and everything that's going on and all the things of just like, women are being really conscious of their fertility at a younger age. And so preparing for your fertility is really important. And so just because you're 33 doesn't mean, you know, going and freezing your eggs is automatically going to render you like the best eggs possible, right? It's like, you might have youth on your side, but there can be a lot of things that are in the way that could compromise quality or even the way your body assimilates and utilizes the hormones. So I think, um, obviously I have it mapped out in the egg quality diet but really just focusing on overall health and, and maximizing that from, from like all the perspectives, like energy and digestion and sleep. And what do you, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think preparation is key. And the wonderful thing for her is like, she said, November, we've yeah. got time, you've got mm -hmm. time. So you're being proactive, which is what we love to see. And um, you're, you're on top of it. So all the things you're doing now, you know, following that diet, changing your lifestyle, taking whatever supplements you're taking, all of these things are good. That's preparation. That's what you're, you're doing that now. So I, I mean, without knowing your case, I don't know that, you know, I would say do anything different. I would just say, do that, stick to that and, and be good with that between now and then. And for all those women, like you mentioned, who are thinking about FETs or freezing embryos or eggs or want to just have a plan, mm -hmm. like the plan is to start to address your health and your, your hormones and your reproductive health now before you ever get to that point in time where you're behind the eight ball, right? Like you want to be preventative and proactive. Ahead of the game. Ahead of the game. Yeah. Um, Oh, Where do you see these questions? I don't see any questions. Oh, I guess they're probably just on my side. People are posting them. So like in that question box, I wonder if you can see the question box on your side. Um, do you, I skipped someone. Do you think that taking prednisone could help during stim cycle if you have TH1, TH2, and NK cells elevated? I mean, my short answer is yes. 
I mean, I do, I do think, I, I don't know that there's much explanation if that's, if yeah. you're just looking for a yes but or no, I would say yeah. It lowers inflammation. At the minimum, right. like low-dose naltrexone, maybe during stims, right. then once you transfer, if you know you have NK cells, I think with any transfer, you should consider some type of uh, immune support and, and prednisone seems to be one of the best ways to go. So I agree. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's an anti-inflammatory and, and our whole approach is anti-inflammatory and, and natural killer cells are inflammatory and the TH1, TH2 being off. So absolutely. Um, yeah. And I love, I mean, you mentioned uh, LDN, um, low, do low dose naltrexone, which is one of my favorite um, to use when when you can and when it's appropriate, really safe um, and typically get a lot of good results. So that's also a way to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's, it's like LDN.com. Like you can go online if you're in the U.S. and get a prescription kind of wherever you are for low dose. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, one of my patients discovered it. I'm pretty positive. It's called LDN.com. Let me just double check. Um, and you know that you do a, like a little quick interview. I think it's a couple hundred bucks. It's not. Yeah, the physician is evaluating you and then giving and then and then making that uh, prescription. That's a wonderful resource. Yeah, it's not LDN.com. Um, <laughs> uh, LDNDoctor.com, I think is okay. It is, but I just I just googled LDN script, and there's one get.agelessrx.com uh cfs pharmacy those are LDS great doctor. resources for everybody because yeah. that's a, a wonderful way to get it yeah well I, I said this the other day it came up of like someone was like is it safe i'm like i'll tell you this like what kind of got me looking at it more was you know i, I want I, there's this I have a lot of physicians, female physicians in my practice who are trying to conceive in their 40s. And every single one of them is doing LDN, like, because they've just read the research and they're like coming to yeah. me, they're like, oh, I'm on 4.5 milligrams of LDN. And I was like, oh, fascinating. Yeah. And so I, um, I think it's one of those things, like you said, it's very safe. It can't hurt. We know it's going to help with inflammation. Yeah. Um, you know, so. I will say the only thing I'll say about the dosaging there where I've seen it work better without any si initial side effects is... Sure. Start lower, yeah, and, then, and then ramp up. Yeah. Like low and slow. Yeah. Um, yeah. The questions come in interesting. Okay. How many sessions of acupuncture should you do before going through IVF? I'll let you take that. How many sessions? So what the research specifically says, and then we have two different conversations here, because now IVF used to be a catch-all phrase to mean the whole process, right. and now it's different. Like now, for the most part, there's retrieval cycles. There's transfer cycles, unless you're doing a fresh cycle. Um, and so just thinking about it at each section, each piece of that. But in general, the research um, is pretty clear, at, which is an odd number. It's 11. <laughs> uh, um, leading up. So like, can, leading up, yeah. So we ramp it. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah, so we, you know, we round it up to 12. Um, so it's not about necessarily months, spreading yeah. them out. If you're going to do it once a week, that's three months. If you have less time, then you're doubling up, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes per week. And we get calls, hey, I'm three weeks out. What can I do? And that's where we see you more frequently and recommend that more frequently. So that's, that would be before retrieval and then also before transfer. Um, and then additionally, you know, there's the transfer day, uh, treatment yeah, as well. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Agreed. That's like, it's the newer research is interesting that it's like the, the more consistent acupuncture in the lead up to the cycle yeah. is actually the most beneficial, not just doing the pre and post, although we all still do those right. and find them highly effective, um, as well. And the fertility doctors love us for that. Right. Um, okay. Let me go back here. So. Um, oh, tap to answer the question. Oh, I see. This is interesting. Look at that. So now can you see the question? What? I can see the question. Oh. oh, oh, on there. Oh, yeah, I can see the question there. But I was okay. looking now that you told me where you were seeing. So. Oh, okay. So okay. So we can. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, I never know. I have a little Q&A thing that popped up on my screen. I've never done it this way. I like it. Um, so ERA was done at 127 hours of PIO which is okay. progesterone. Does it have to be done right at 120 hours? So if it's, oh, no, I have to go back here. No, um, you can't see it. So if it's receptive, does it matter when it's done? FET was done at 125.5 hours. Yeah, so it does matter when it's done. Yeah, so when you get the 
or not when you, but when the doctor gets the report for the ERA, they don't usually say, oh, it needs to be done on this specific hour. They're giving you a window of time. It's, a, it's, a, it's an, an hour's window. And that's where they say you are receptive in this window of time. And as long as it's done in that window of time, then you're fine, which it sounds like it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, I did the fibroid one. Okay, failed FET, PGT normal for AB, PIO, and prednisone. Have done all the tests, all is normal. What should I do next? Um, that was a lot to take in. I'm trying to yeah. find it so I can read it. So, I mean, I'll start and then you, you add in. It's like, I, I think I have a couple questions right away. Oh, I see it. Okay. Failed. Um, you know, because that could be just not every IVF transfer takes, and you could be doing everything perfect. Um, right. If it's not the first failed, and you've done this protocol now more than once, and it hasn't worked with a PGT normal, you know, I I do some further testing. I'd consider endometrial biopsy if you haven't already had it, or the Alice and Emma test for looking for endometritis, or the um, ERA. The ERA, um, you know, there's the receptiva too to see is there, uh, you know, endometriosis, um, you know, things like that to see even, even I would consider, I mean, it depends on the case and kind of all the other things like we'd be looking at you full picture if we were with you in the clinic or, or coaching you. Um, but if there are signs or symptoms or previous history of autoimmune conditions, I'm, I might consider something like the Prevune testing, you know, just to kind of rule out any other inflammatory uh, issues or in immune issues that are going on that are preventing implantation from happening. Yeah, I mean, all, all the right things. I, I'm always skeptical, and I'm not saying this is a um, something on you when you say this, but I'm always skeptical when someone says to me, I've done all the testing and everything's normal. I agree. So, and it's not you, because then I'm like, yeah. send me the testing. And then I'm right. like, oh, like, they didn't do this, and they didn't do that, and they right. didn't do this. And how much prednisone did you, maybe you should try adding the baby yeah. ask. You know, there's like so many things. Right. There's so, so much nuance to it. A hundred percent. And it is, it's frustrating for us because, you know, you're in the middle, if you will. The doctor says, oh, we've, we've ruled out all the clouding factors. And then you'll send the test to us. And we're like, you didn't check this one or this one or this one. Right. Um, and so it is this kind of game. And I, I, I feel sorry for you that you've gone through it, but um, keep digging. I think you, another great book to look at is, is your body baby friendly? I do think there's some really useful information in there to educate yourself and, and bring that to your doctor as well, too. Um, I do think the egg quality diet, like part of what is really helpful about it is reducing inflammation, regulating the immune system, which can also, in essence, make the uterus more hospitable and help with implantation. Yeah, as well. yeah absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, my left tube has fluid and is blocked. What can I do other than removing my tube? How about you? Um... I mean, certainly if there's fluid and more specifically that fluid is coming into the uterine cavity, that's a problem. Um, I mean, I would probably personally first start with some, before we decided to remove it, I would start with some acupuncture, some herbs, um, some supplements, change your diet, um, really things that would reduce any inflammation that that might be causing. Um, and then, then see what's going on, reevaluate it. And at that point, if it's still there, then maybe at that point, you know, it does need to come out um, because that, that fluid coming into the uterine cavity will definitely impact implantation and be a problem. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree across the board. Um, okay, um, there's another one. To read the whole thing here though, sorry. I'm 43, I've been experiencing perimenopause symptoms and wondering if I will have to do IVF in order to get pregnant or is there still a chance I can get pregnant on my own? Um, I mean, I look, I always believe in someone's ability to conceive naturally. Um, I think there's variables that need to be looked at. Are you having a regular cycle? What do your hormones look like and so forth? I always believe that's possible. If you're looking for maybe the better way to conceive the maybe hopefully faster, 
way, then I do think IVF would be something that should absolutely be considered in the mix. Um, yeah. And depending yeah. on what your hormones look like, how you approach it, who you work with and all of those things. So, you know, once we, it, you know, you're having perimenopausal symptoms. So that's, you know, to me, a sign that says, okay, we've got to be more aggressive with this right now, whether it's more aggressive with treatment or more aggressive saying, I'm going to do IVF, whatever that might be. Um, but that's something that needs to be uh, regulated and supported. And at the same time, then, you know, that has to be factored into your, your plan. Now, if you said to me, I have no intention of ever doing IVF, then I'd say, okay, well, let's be aggressive in getting your hormones back on track. And then, you know, you just got to keep trying. Yeah. I think ovarian PRP could be really a good consideration here as well yep, to just absolutely. keep the ovaries and kind of jumpstart things. And then I also think, like, and I'm sure you see this too, and, and this isn't um, a criticism of, of you, Donna, asking the question, but are they actually perimenopausal symptoms or is it just right. hormonal imbalance leading to an irregular cycle at the age of 43? You know, because right. it's like we really need that FSH, I think, to know whether or not we're really headed there. Um, yeah. And, and estradiol with it, but yeah. Yeah, and estradiol with it, of course, because one impacts the other. And so, um, but if you haven't done like all the things that we recommend from a diet and lifestyle and supplement perspective, that is the, I think the first starting point to see the cycle regularity, but like for certain, like I know you have, and I have at that at 43 for sure, have we helped women restore normal ovulatory cycles a hundred percent. And yeah. so I would still consider doing some of that work before starting IVF, just so you have better outcomes as well. Yeah. Um, okay. I did the fibroid one. Okay. These are great questions, by the way. Yes, everybody. so good, guys. Um, yeah. Infrared sauna while trying to conceive. I understand the concern of heating for heating up the testicles. If husband uses it for how long should we wait to try to conceive? I don't know that if he's using it regularly. Well, first is, is there even a, a sperm issue, right? Is there, if the semen analysis is, is good and everything looks fine i would have no concern using yeah. uh the sauna um maybe minimize and infrared it. too versus yeah so because there has a lot of benefits for it um but maybe you reduce the time a little bit maybe yeah. you're reducing the frequency maybe you're not doing it right or he's not doing it right during your fertile window but he can do it before and after you know so i think there's ways to work that in now if if <clears throat> his sperm quality is um, really poor, I'm taking two extremes, really poor, then I, you know, that might be cause to pull back for sure um, and see, but on the same token, the infrared might be beneficial. So it's hard. I think we've got to look at the whole, the whole picture, but I think uh, reducing time, reducing frequency is kind of the same, the safe way to do it. Yeah. 100%. Agreed. Um, okay. Trying to, Trying since 2019, uh, POI diagnosed in 2016, has child my, oh, had, had a child with my own eggs in 2018, so should be POI diagnosis. I've done the egg quality diet, supplements, ovarian PRP in February, Feb fertility acupuncture since 2019, haven't gotten any eggs during IVF since March. Anything else I can do? Um... So, and she's 39. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I often question the POI diagnosis. Um, I, I don't necessarily, <laughs> yeah, I don't always find it to be, to be an accurate. accurate diagnosis when I, when I evaluate things. So that's the first question I would have. The second question is, it seems like you've been pretty aggressive trying to make all these changes. Who, you know, who's guiding you on all of that? Because you might need to take a step back. You might need, um, if you've been on all these things for a while, you might need just to reevaluate and, and take a slightly different approach. So it's a hard one to answer without really diving deeper into, into the case. Agreed. And I also like another thing, I, I feel like it came up a lot. I was just in my, my private group doing office hours this morning and this conversation comes up a lot. And, and I think from an emotional perspective too, of like stepping back and, and just saying like, but am I willing, am I going to stop? You know what I mean? Or, or what am I willing to do moving forward to maintain my health and give myself and my fertility like the best chances possible 
without maybe trying too hard or like letting that lead. And, and so having that really honest conversation with yourself of even though it hasn't worked yet, are you ready to walk away from trying for this second child? And, and just like emotionally checking in with yourself because a lot of women um, I find when I work with them, it's like, oh God, no, I'm not gonna stop. And it's like, okay, so then let's find what's like livable for you. What's an actual plan that feels good, that is beneficial to your health and your fertility. And this next baby is like the cherry on top versus right. I have to be done with fertility altogether, you know? And that's, it's a yeah. bit of surrender. And it's, a, it's, it's not, it's easy for me to say it, not always easy to do, but you know, another piece of that, I think to think about. I, re I really like that approach. Um, I would actually just add as well, it doesn't sound like you had a lot of time between your first child delivery and then trying. Um, and you know, maybe you just need a little space to recover and allow your body without all, I, again, I don't know everything you've been doing, but it sounds like you've been on a bunch of hormones and cycle. So you know, maybe you just need a break and a little time to just let, allow your body to recover as well, to give it the space that it needs to achieve the results that you're looking for. I love that part. And it's such an important point. I think, especially like women and the trauma of fertility treatments and trying and when they get pregnant, then they're already planning number two, because they feel like this time crunch. Right. Chinese medicine, we really like a year and a half between birth and next pregnancy. And that yeah. is for recovery. And for your strength and, you know, your ability to go back in. And there's other factors, too. Were you breastfeeding, right? I mean, there's just so many layers to it, too. So I think that's such a, a great point, Mark. Um, thank you for making it. Um, I heard sperm can contribute to chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, you heard? Yeah. Correctly. Yeah, 100%. 100. 100 <laughs> percent. 100,000 trillion percent. Um, <laughs> Uh, 41 had one egg retrieval, 10 follicles, but when I woke up, I only had five. They said the other five had gooey like substance in them. They said mm. it was endometritis slash endometriosis with a question mark. Okay. I don't remember which one. I would assume endometriosis. So it, it probably, I don't know if they would call them chocolate cysts or something like that, but, um, that's which, interesting. Yeah. I, Cause if you don't normally see that with, uh, an egg retrieval, no, um, gooey like substance. Perhaps they saw other signs of endo when they were in there for the retrieval, although it's, you know, they're not really looking around that much. A, I'd be curious to read the report. The report, I agree. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it definitely is endometriosis, though, is what they said over endometritis, I, I would assume, because endometritis is in the uterine lining and usually is yeah. a, a bacterial infection um, or something of the sort or a microbiome imbalance. Um, so yes, there's a lot you can do to manage endometriosis. Uh, you know, Mark and I both have a, a ton of information on that. Um, but I do think we both firmly agree that like some kind of autoimmune paleo style diet, like good quality fats, protein, low inflammation, um, acupuncture, Chinese herbs, you know, castor oil packs, all of those things to really improve circulation and blood flow as well to the ovaries, uh, can be really helpful here. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's a big drop off from 10 to 5. So I understand the disappointment um, with that. But I'd also look at the sizes of all of those. Like if those were the ones that were on the smaller side and more immature, yeah, you know, maybe they wouldn't have made it anyway. And so we're just counting them because we want to have a higher number. But yeah. the reality is, is you would have ended up with five anyway. So it just depends. Yeah, and fertilization rate, right? Like it really right. comes down, you could get 10 and only have fertilized, you know, so it's like right. the attrition is painful, but it's it's pretty common to cut off like that, you know? Um, yeah. And so it is 1232, how much time do you have left? Because there's more questions. I've got time, I'm okay. good. Let's let, yeah. we'll go for like another 10, how about that? That's um, fine. Um, I just wanna, I feel like they're coming in um, kind of erratically, I wanna jump. <laughs> Like, I want to honor the people who posted them first. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Let's just see. Okay, those are answered questions. Oh, okay. So I see. They're just moving them up. Okay. Oh, but if... Okay, never mind. Um, let me get back. There's a lot of questions. There's there's one that I see about um, oh. injections on day three. So on which yeah. day of IVF meds yeah. will I feel any symptoms? Is it normal not to feel anything on day three of injections? I think it's normal. Yeah. It's early. 
just um, juicing them up. It's getting there. It's getting there. And it, yeah. and it depends on dosage of the medication and um, how many follicles you have growing. So, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, suggestions for improving sperm morphology specifically. Other factors were fine, but morphology was 3%. Um, so I might not worry about that. I'm not saying I wouldn't do anything, but I might not worry about a 3% morphology if the count is nice and high. Mm -hmm. If yeah, the count is on the low. Yeah. Right. But normal could, like 15 million normal, eh, I, you know, that's different. 3% you know, of, of 15 million is different than 3% of 50 or more, right? So, but 3% is really not a bad number. And I've seen plenty of men have, um, successful pregnancies with 1% normal um, when all the other parameters were nice and high. So not saying I wouldn't do anything about it, but I might not worry so much about it um, and focus on other things and then kind of just do a little bit to support that um, in terms of some nice antioxidants. Um, you know, same things that you would think of for egg quality, you kind of think of similarly for sperm quality. And this, would be, this would be sperm quality. So, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I have a video too on um, like the healthy daddy protocol, if you will. If you just uh, I'm, and I'm positive, Mark has YouTube videos on this too. You just go on our YouTube channels and they're, they're there. Yeah. Um, something. Yeah. Uh, following. <laughs> Twenty-seven. Two recent miscarriages. First was unknown, but second was Turner's. Um, my AMH, FSH, and recurrent miscarriage panel labs are all normal. I'm working on egg quality improvement. Would it be smart if my husband gets DNA frag test before we start trying again? I would. Yeah, same. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, no. And then the same thing that we said to the other one that had all the tests, like make sure that recurrent miscarriage panel was complete and all done. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one thing that I would really consider too. Um, and continue with doing all the things. Anything else there, Mark? No, I mean, look, we know that there's Turner syndrome, so it's not like there's not something there that we're aware yeah, of. Exactly. Um, so just make sure everything else is ruled out. Yeah. Um, here's a good question. I think we're on the same page with this, but should caffeine be avoided in the fertile window? Is an alternative okay, such as a mushroom one? I don't know. You want to start and I'll tell you if we're yeah. on the same path. <laughs> I, I think caffeine is fine. I always say, you know, um, 81 milligrams or even 100 milligrams of organic caffeine on a daily basis. The key is not on an empty stomach. It, it does a number to the adrenals. Um, and so I always recommend it with some protein and some fat. So, um, yeah, I think we're on the same page. Yeah, and we're totally on the same page. When I have my coffee every morning, yeah. I, I know. I remember like getting your coffee that one time out in San Diego and it was like, oh, was, yeah, remember, right. like, Bulletproof was like brand new and it was like, it was brand new. putting like yeah. butter in the coffee. And <laughs> yeah, it's my version of Bulletproof. I've got ghee in it and I've got um, a little bit of honey and I've got my uh, colostrum in it, mm -hmm. um, some collagen. Yeah. Blend it right up and you're good to go. So, but I agree like a little bit. I think the only time you might have to be, what was that? What colostrum do you use? Oh, uh, my favorite, uh, Sir Thrival. Um, what is it? It makes it Sir Thrival. It makes it nice and creamy. Um, Ooh, it, the the totally only time funny. to be, yeah, the only time to be concerned about the caffeine, I think, is if you've had recurrent pregnancy loss. Then I might pull back a little bit more. But other than that, like you can have some caffeine. I agree with yeah. with Amy, and I would. I want to stress the point she said. She's so organic. Coffee beans are highly sprayed, full of chemicals. It's a really important crop. And so they want to make sure that it, it survives and they make money off of it, which means chemicals and, pest and, and um, Roundup and pesticides and all that sort of stuff is used heavily. So you really want it to be organic um, as much as possible so that you're not getting those chemicals and toxins. Yeah. Coffee yeah. has one of the highest pesticide loads and does a yeah. tremendous amount of damage to us. So we have it with um, organic and with protein and fat. Yeah. Uh, okay, 43, how can I optimize my chances with IUI? At this time, I can't afford IVF. So, okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see an issue with IUI versus IVF at your age. Um, optimizing is all the things that we've been saying, right? Like yeah. um, a- doing all the preparation work that we've been talking about and, and when we answered all these questions today. So I do think that that has to be part of your mix. Yeah. But so much of the success is also going to depend upon the, uh, how much of the medication they give you and uh-huh. how closely are they monitoring you and how well is the timing with IUI? I love back-to-back IUIs, and by back-to-back meaning consecutive days yeah. of IUI, I do see a higher success exactly. rate. Yeah, um, so I do like to recommend that, meaning they're going to do it either the day before you ovulate and the day of ovulation mm-hmm. or the day of ovulation the day after, right? So it's back-to-back, that's what I mean, not consecutive cycles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I agree, um, yeah. too, of, like, less is more a lot of times with medication, but you could also do injectables with IUI and get, mm-hmm. you know, it, it just really, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. There's no reason that the IUI can't work. And, and especially if you were going to do IVF and not genetically test, you know. Yeah. And, and sperm quality becomes uber important here because the sperm, so make sure that's being supported and, and yeah. you've tested because that sperm have to be able to swim to get to where they want to go. So. Um, okay. Thoughts on red light therapy panels like Juve? How long each day? Is there any caution during the luteal phase? Yes. So, uh, we've been using it, um, not that specific machine in our right. practice since January. Um, and seeing some, some nice results. Um, you using the, that one? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the, so the low light the, level, yeah. low light LED, mm-hmm. um, and um, so you can't. So the the minimal research that's been done shows that you need to do it repeatedly throughout the week. So it's not like once a week is not going to be sufficient. Right. So I would say at least two to three. If you have one at home, then go ahead and use it every day. Thirty minutes. It's it's usually set on a program, so it's uh-huh. usually thirty minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't recommend using it in the luteal phase at all. So you're doing it in the, if you're tra- actively trying, you're just doing it the first two weeks and not the last mm-hmm. two weeks of every cycle. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, what levels of testosterone and DHEs would warrant supplementation of DHEA? How do you, what, do you want to start or? Yeah, well, you go ahead. Um, so. It's it's hard to say. Um, oh, go ahead. There's, yeah, there's ranges and there's dosages. So I tend to be cautious. So unless someone's is extremely low um, in their labs, I'm not ever putting anyone on 75 personally. Ever. Yeah, same. Ever. <laughs> so if they were, you know, let's just say they were at 40, then mm-hmm. I might say, okay, we're going to do 75 for like a month. Let's retest. Let's track it. I'm going to watch it closely because there's a lot of potential side effects and issues that can arise. So I'm pretty careful with it. Um, I would start, and depending on where the levels are, you might just start at 25. You might start at 15. You might start at 10. Like, yeah, it just depends if it needs a little boost. Right. You yeah. know, because um, everybody has their own reaction. But same thing. Yeah. It's like getting the DHES tested and usually you know that kind of Im- that'll impact the testosterone as well so but if they're both low it could be reason to supplement but i would start really low and like mark said you stay on top of the testing um i i think both of us agree I, I've, I've never seen great success at the 75 i feel like you know i don't know ovarian burnout is kind of more like you know it's like a very and then also a lot of the doctors at the Dutch, you know, and we both use the Dutch test right. a lot. They do not like that level of 75. And they, they say, like, once you start taking that, your body does become dependent on it. So when, when you stop, there's, there's also great implications, too. It's such a high dose. A low dose is like, it kind of like, it's, it stimulates follicular genesis. And it just encourages those ovaries to do what they need to do. So you really got to be careful with DHEA. Yeah, and you mentioned the Dutch test, so I was actually going to say, yeah. if I'm really um, concerned, I'll run a Dutch panel, and I'll see how you're metabolizing your DHEA and how strong your androgen levels are um, and where you have a preference. And depending on what that looks like, I might be a little bit more cautious or a little bit more carefree because that's telling me how you can metabolize it and use it. So I, I feel a little bit more comfortable with being able to kind of manage that better. Yeah. 
hundred percent. Um, okay. Let's do one more and then we're going to let ourselves, um, wrap this up. Okay. Oh, let's see. Um, husband is a competitive cyclist has ha I've had two losses. I have Hashi. It's managed with meds, supplements, diet, acupuncture. Um, Ari, the husband does wearing tight cycling gear and working out for hours at a time play negatively affect male fertility. So, I mean, I mean, yes, but the, the question becomes, what is his, yeah, what are his labs showing, right? Like if his sigma analysis looks fine, his DNA fragmentation looks fine. Like there might not be any real concern. It, and you mentioned several things that yeah. you already know on your side that we know can be impacting things. 100%. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, you can also you do a test and ask him. The, yeah, the immunological testing. That's the one thing I would yeah. recommend for you, especially knowing that you have Hashis. Um, that, that's, yeah, so agreed oh, across the yeah. board. Um, and, and you can also ask him, like, is he willing to give you, like, three months or six months of not just to test it out? And see. And see. And go from there. Some, you know, meet in the middle someplace. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yeah. This was amazing. Let's do this, like, once a month. I love it. I love it. This was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was so fun. Okay. You go. Enjoy your day. Um, Thank you, too. Else, thank you so much for the amazing questions. We loved it. And Mark and I will do this again soon and continue to support you guys so you can bring home that dream baby. Yes. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have Bye. a wonderful Thursday. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye. Talk to you later. Okay.